Welcome everybody and thanks for tuning in. Uh, I hope you can hear me. I'm going to be doing a reading today of the Shani Mahatmya, which is uh, a Vedic upaya, a remedy for afflictions of the planets. Now, I don't want to talk too much. Um, I'd rather just, just read and let the story do its work. Um, this tale is thousands and thousands of years old. It's been told for millennia. It carries uh, a very strong vibration. It is a hymn to the greater cosmic order. And by letting the myth and the archetype seep into you, it will work on you from within and align you with this greater cosmic order, as well as purifying body, mind and spirit and bringing some understanding of why we suffer, and why we have obstacles and challenges in our lives, and it will give you, us, me as well, the, the strength to meet those challenges, whatever they may be. Now, um, I urge you all to pay attention, uh, not because I'm, I'm craving, <laughs> I'm craving you uh, to, to listen to my voice, but um, the deeper you allow the story to work within you, it will, well, the benefits will be more. So pay attention. Uh, in fact, there's a number of times in the text where the reader is, uh, the, the listener is urged to pay attention. So the other thing we'll do is just create a little bit of a, a sacred space uh, uh, um, outside of ordinary time and reality. Um, how are we going to do this? Well, I've got a little bit of incense burning here. A uh, nice bit of Pushka Rose, thank you very much, Jai Pushka Raj Ki. And um, I'm just going to ding me little dinger here. And we'll start. It starts with the Shani Mantra, and then we get into the story. So I hope you're sitting comfortably. And uh, <laughs> we'll begin. Just let me take a sip of my coffee before we start. Bolinata. Shri Shane Charya Namaha Om Sham Shri Chane Charya Namaha Om Sham Shri Shane Charya Namaha Chapter 1 King Vikrama deliberates in his court over which of the nine planets is superior. The heroic Vikramaditya once ruled the city of Ujjain. He was an intellectual philanthropist of a king who clung tenaciously to righteousness and was ever anxious to relieve his subjects' miseries. He guarded his citizens as carefully as if they had been his own children, and they in turn regarded him with the same respect that they accorded their own fathers. So long as King Vikrama ruled Ujjain, Uprightness and good conduct permeated every corner of the kingdom and every resident was righteous and happy. Radiating as he did the luster of the guardians of the ten directions, King Vikrama drew all the greatest minds of the age to his court. Like bees are drawn to a particularly nectarian flower. And just as bees help a plant to multiply, 
the king multiplied his own knowledge by drawing these experts into discussion on thorny issues of thorny issues of religion, morality, or statecraft. Questions on which they would debate and deliberate long and hard before finally reaching a consensus. On one such occasion, King Vikrama sat serenely in his Caprician court, incense coiling silently around his throne, surrounded by a slew of ritual specialists, ministers of state, courtiers and pundits. After these assembled worthies had picked several preliminary topics threadbare, confabulation began on a subject that was dear to the king's heart. Which of the nine planets is paramount? Each planet had its champion among those mages who, like the great Varahamira, had successfully traversed the vast ocean of astrological knowledge. Each partisan was a sincere worshipper of the planet he championed, and long worship had delivered to each some of the attributes of that planet, attributes which shone through to colour their several presentations. Stillness descended on all sides of the throne, as every ear listened with one pointed concentration for the experts to state their opinions. Now, I won't read through every planet uh, because we'll be here till, well, for another few hours. So I'll go straight to Saturn. And there we have an image of Mahagraha Shani. King Vikramaditya. King Vikramaditya, to forestall further wrangling, motioned for quiet at this point and said, Now tell me about the seventh planet. The tall, dark, thin seventh pundit, whose dress and manner betokened his traditionalist, conservative nature, was the very portrait of disciplined authoritativeness. He spoke with his eyes slightly downcast, a shadow of harshness in his voice, his words, over, his words reverberated across the palace's marble like the core of a distant crow skips along the surface of a glacier. O oh, king, he began, Saturn is the supreme terrifier among the planets. All beings fear him, for he rules bereavements and misfortunes. If pleased, he will give you a kingdom, but if irate, he will snatch everything away from you in a moment. His gaze, make, his grace makes you happy, while his wrath so thoroughly ruins you that your name is completely forgotten in the human world. Saturn determines longevity and death, for he is lord of time. The ambition of kings is great, but their lives are fleeting. All the kings who have ever ruled the earth with their might have been reduced by time to tales that others tell. Even King Indra and all the gods panic when Saturn is nearby, for over the ages many thousands of Indras have been overtaken by the power of time. Lord Saturn is tall, black, long-limbed and emaciated, with reddish-brown eyes, large teeth and nails, Prominent veins, a sunken stomach, a long beard, matted locks and profuse, coarse, stiff body hair. He is lame and his limbs are rigid. His constitution is vata, extremely harsh. He is cruel in authority and his gaze, which is directed downcast, is utterly terrifying. He is a shudra. Some even call him outcast. By trade he is an oil presser who worships Kala Bhairav, the great black terrifier. His metal is iron and his gem is blue sapphire. Lord of the sinews and nerves of the west of Saturday and of the constellations Capricorn and Aquarius, he is also known as the slow, son of shadow, the angular, the black, the endless, the end causer, the all devouring, the steady, the controller, the famished, and the emaciated. Saturn is the son of the sun and his wife's shadow, Chaya. As soon as Saturn was born, his gaze fell upon his father and caused vitiligo. 
His gaze next fell on the son's charioteer, who fell and broke his thigh. And when the gaze lit upon the seven horses of the son's chariot, they went stone blind. The son tried a number of remedies to remove these infirmities, but nothing worked. It was only when Saturn's gaze left them that the son's skin cleared, his charioteer's femur healed, and his horses regained their sight. Although Saturn became a planet after performing penance in Benares and propitiating Lord Shiva, he did not even spare his benefactor. When Shiva's son Ganesha was born, his mother Parvati wanted to show the boy to Saturn. Saturn politely advised her not to do so. But when she insisted, he gazed, as the gazed at the child reluctantly with only one eye. Instantly, Ganesha's head was reduced to ashes. To prevent Parvati in her anger from destroying the universe, Lord Vishnu flew north on his eagle, Garuda, and finding a bull elephant exhausted from intercourse with his mace, cut off his head, returned with it, and joined it successfully to Ganesha's body. If you hope to prevent Saturn from mangling your life, as he has mangled so many lives, make regular offerings of black sesame seeds, sesame oil and sugar on Saturdays to an iron image of that planet. Also, make Saturday donations of sesame and iron to the needy. I make my sincere obeisance to that Lord Saturn, whose colour is that of pure collyrium, who is the son of the son of shadow, sun and shadow, and who is the god, the brother of Yama, the god of righteousness and death? So, I'll skip forward a few pages. To chapter eleven, the verdict. The time for King Vikrama to pronounce his judgment had now arrived. Everyone in the court savants and hangers-on alike turned expectedly towards their sovereign and made ready to imbibe the nectar of his comments just as sunflowers swivel towards the sun to best soak up its rays the king turned over in his mind all that he'd heard the lineages the unique powers the accounts of heroism and nobility but again and again his mind turned towards saturn and Saturn's extreme cruelty. Finally, a peculiar sort of melancholy sprouted in the king's heart, a temporarily impenetrable gloom, and suddenly these words escaped his lips. Better to have, not have a son at all than to have one with such a hateful gaze as Saturn's. Since Lord Saturn tormented his own father, who will he not torment? Tell me, O oh wise ones. It so happened. Fate ordained it. That at that moment, Saturn was passing overhead, flying through the skies in his aerial car. Overhearing the king's remark, he expeditiously landed his craft and entered the assembly hall. As that tall, emaciated, lame planet the embodiment of all that is inexorable in life strode into the palace. The king and everyone present rose at once to their feet. Their voices dried in their mouths by amazement and fear at the terrible sight. They pitched forward at once onto the ground, prostrating rigidly like staves. There are moments in life which occur just after an inappropriate comment slips from your tongue. You wish in such moments to simply recall those last few words. But since, once spoken, speech can never be recalled, that one ill-advised moment may overshadow everything else you do for the rest of your life. This was such a moment for King Vikrama. As his heart fell from his mouth to his toes and was replaced there by the taste of ashes, he put on a brave face and prostrated to Saturn's feet with the utmost reverence. Seating that incarnation of inevitability on his very throne, King Vikrama offered that planet every sort of respect and worshipped him intently, aware as he did so that his fate was already sealed. When the king was finished, 
The dark countenance sat and spoke to him in a voice that rang with the cold calm of reality. O oh, Vikramaditya, you have insulted me in front of the entire assembly without even knowing the extent of my capabilities. Are you aware that Indra and all the other divas quiver in front of me? You know that whomever I get angry with, I totally destroy. But what you have not yet comprehended is that I do not allow even a trace of that miscreant to remain. No, not even his name. While flying through the air just now, I sensed you expressing your disgust for me. As it is, I am about to enter the constellation Virgo, which occupies the twelfth house of your horoscope. This means that for seven and a half years, you will have no choice but to learn precisely who I am. At the moment, your reason has deviated from its proper course, but soon you will know what my powers really are. I shall remove those airs of yours. Mark my words. You do not yet know my prowess. The moon resides in one constellation of the zodiac for a mere two and a quarter days. The sun, Mercury and Venus for a month each. Mars for one and a half months, Jupiter for twelve months, and Rahu and Ketu for eighteen months. But I remain for a full thirty months in each sign, and I have delivered prolonged misery even to the gods themselves. Hear my words with full concentration, O king. When I waylaid Sri Ramachandra, the incarnation of God himself, he was sent into exile in the forest, and when I accosted Ravana, Sri Ramachandra and Lakshmana collected an army, invaded Lanka, killed Ravana, and destroyed his entire family. So now, King Vikrama, you had better prepare for misfortune. On completing his tirade, Saturn rose straight away, just as Vikramaditya fell to the ground. Grabbing hold of Saturn's two dark feet in dismay, the king cried loudly, O oh Lord Saturn, forgive me for this offence, I beg of you, have mercy on this poor miserable wretch. Saturn said, If I show compassion to you, you will never obtain personal knowledge of my abilities. At least once you must experience my play, otherwise your insolence will not leave you. Having said this, Saturn re-entered his vehicle and sped away through space to his own realm. Burning with immense regret for his grave error in insulting Lord Saturn, King Vikramaditya left his court post-haste, bound for the royal temple where he worshipped God in his agony. Then he said to himself, I have insulted Saturn, that mightily cruel planet, and I will now definitely harvest the fruit of this action, the workings of my own karmas that have brought me to this pass. Did the moon know when he stole Jupiter's wife that it would lead him to suffer Daksha's curse? Did Daksha realise that cursing the moon would cost him his head? But even those who are aware of their actions are not freed from their consequences. Even the blessed Vishnu himself had to return to beg the universe from Bali after he cheated that self-same Bali out of the Amrita that the Asuras had earned at the churning. What has happened must be endured. What is destined does not change. What is the use in regretting it? Thinking in this way, he had his dinner and lay down fitfully to sleep. On arising the next morning, he returned to his court where he engaged himself in ruling in his habitual manner. Outwardly, he seemed normal. Within, he fretted day and night over what sort of torment Lord Saturn may have in store for him. A month passed thus. Chapter 12 
the beginning of the seven and a half year period of Saturn's dominance of Vikramaditya's life. Thereafter, when that exceptionally cruel planet Saturn entered the constellation Virgo, the twelfth house of Vikramaditya's horoscope as counted from his moon, a well-educated astrologer came to visit that heroic monarch. He said, Great King! The particularly severe planet known as Saturn has now entered the twelfth house from your moon and your seven and a half year period of Saturnian dollar has begun. You have spoken about this planet in ordinary terms, but he is acclaimed as Mahakaruna, which means mega cruel, in all the three worlds. Now is the time to perform worship, to give alms and to have mantras recited for you that you may appease Saturn and escape from his tortures. Select a learned and devout Brahmana and have him recite Saturn's mantra for you 23,000 times. After the mantra recitation is finished, have 5,750 offerings made into the sacred fire. Donate black gram, black cloth, iron and oil to a Brahmana and feed Brahmanas. Wear a pure blue sapphire on your body. If you have mantras recited for you, and feed some Brahmanas. And if you revere and worship those Brahmanas who perform those rituals for you as if they were Saturn himself, Saturn will protect, will become peace, peaceable. When he has become satisfied by these means, Saturn will protect you during your seven and a half in the same way as he would protect his own son. King Vikramaditya answered, I will certainly attempt to propitiate Saturn by offering abundant arms and by arranging for all due worship to be performed. But I am not at all confident that he will become pleased with me. If, as soon as he was born, he harassed his mother and father, then what good things will he do for anyone else? Whatever is written in one's fate happens with certainty, and there is no escaping from it. Please return to your home. Saying this, the king bade farewell to the pundit. One day shortly thereafter, Saturn took the form of a rich merchant and arrived in Ujjain to sell horses. Oh, listeners, the storyteller says, pay attention. Many rich men came to that merchant to purchase horses. And when King Vikrama heard of this, he ordered his master of horse to go and buy some excellent ones. Obedient to his king's order, the master of horse visited the merchant's table and selected a horse with good pedigree. When he heard the price, he was so stunned that he ran to tell the king, and King Vikrama was so stunned himself that he came to see those horses for himself. Saturn, in the merchant's disguise, showed the king horse after horse, and when the king asked the merchant the horse's price, Saturn replied, Your Majesty, after you've ridden a horse and decided that you like him, only then will I tell you his price. The king liked a horse named Sarang, so he mounted a rider with a whip on Sarang's back and took him to the nearby parkland for a trial. The rider rode him well, and the king was pleased. By this time, the merchant had brought forward another horse named Aklak, and he said to the king, This horse's price is 100,000 silver rupees. I know that such a price has never been asked for a horse before, but if you will mount him personally and ride him a bit, you will know precisely what is his gait and quality. Then you will be able to judge his value for yourself. The king then mounted the horse and took him to the parkland. After cantering him a bit, he said to no one in particular, This horse is indeed high-spirited and swift. As soon as these words left the king's mouth, Aklak gave a tremendous leap and sailed into the sky at breakneck speed. The more he leapt, the further they flew, as the king held on for dear life. Finally, they penetrated a dense jungle in a faraway land and landed on the bank of a river. <coughs> the king collected himself sufficiently to jump off the horse, who immediately disappeared, as did the river. 
seeing neither the horse nor the river, river. And surrounded by impenetrable forest, King Vikrama was overwhelmed with boundless grief. He sadly asked himself, where shall I go now? And what shall I do? The sun promptly set and darkness spread in all directions with such dispatch that it soon became impossible for the king to see any path through the dismal woods. He had no choice but to pass the night beneath a tree until by the light of the next morning's dawn he emerged with great difficulty from the forest, assailed grievously by hunger and thirst. At that moment a cowherd came along who gave the king some water and showed him the direct road to the nearest town which happened to be the city of Tamalinda about 20 miles away. Sighing gravely and filled with a full measure of the trepidation of presentiment, King Vikrama wearily set out upon the road, advancing slowly towards his fate. Back in Ujjain, the populace had waited patiently, but when by nightfall the king had not descended from the sky, they descended into hopelessness. The whole city was drowned in immense sorrow over the sudden disappearance of their beloved lord and expressions of bone-deep anguish spread among the people like an ache spreads in an afflicted limb. The morning after the king's disappearance, the horse merchant waylaid the prime minister and said, Now please pay me for my horse. The prime minister responded, when the king returns, he will pay you. He then sent men in all directions to search for the sovereign. But since they couldn't get no hint of where he had gone, the prime minister finally had to pay the merchant 100,000 silver rupees, which was the price he had mentioned to the king. Pocketing the money, Saturn became invisible. King Vikrama had meanwhile slowly made his way to the city of Tamalinda. And, on entering it, he encountered, in it, he encountered its shopping bazaar. He sat to rest for some time in front of a trader's shop. It so happened that the trader's sales during that period of time would double his usual take. Noting this, the shopkeeper thought to himself, He must certainly be a very lucky man. And he greeted King Vikrama with great respect, seating the king in his shop. The trader said to him, Please clean your hands, mouth and feet, and then bathe, and do come to my home for your meal. What caste do you belong to? Where is your home? And what is your name? The king replied, By birth I am a Kshatriya, and my homeland is far from here. Wandering, wandering, I reached this city, and seeing your shop, I stopped here for a moment to rest. The merchant responded, you have spoken very well, however it is that you have come. Please come with me now to my home. And so saying, he escorted the king to a well-appointed mansion not far distant. After King Vikrama had bathed and performed his daily worship, the merchant seated him with great pomp and served to him a delicious meal of varied delicacies containing the full complement of all six tastes. After eating until their bellies were full, the two men, washed their hands and faces and began to chew betel nuts and leaves. Now it so happened that the merchant's daughter, by name Alolaika, which means unagitated, was searching for a man of her liking to marry. Her father had also searched diligently but had as yet not found an appropriate man until today, when fate had unexpectedly shipped to his shop this fortunate man who seemed a most appropriate match for his girl. The merchant therefore called his daughter and said to her, Alolaika, I have today found a suitable man for you. Garland him, to signify that she'd selected him for a husband, and marry him. The girl replied, All right, father, but I will marry him only after I have tested him. I must know the extent of his wisdom, cleverness and depth before I will wed him. After evening falls, send that guest of yours to sleep in my art room. 
I will test him there, and if he passes the test, I will marry him. The merchant consequently sent King Vikrama to his daughter's art room. When the king stepped inside the room, he was struck first by the walls which were covered in a variety of pictures of elephants and horses and birds. In the middle of the room, a canopied bed was laid out on which was spread a velvet mattress covered with a white coverlet with embroidered pillows on both sides. In the centre of the ceiling was a pearl chandelier from which canopies of pearls extended in all directions. Lamps threw a brightness like that of the moonlight over the whole scene and garlands of roses distributed their fragrance throughout the room when struck by the breeze. Near the bed was an ivory table on which were arranged flagons of rose water and a variety of perfumed essences. Seeing the room's unparalleled ornamentation, King Vikrama thought, Oh-ho! What country is this? And what beauty is this? The gate of karma is very perplexing. No one is able to know it. All this seems to me to be one of Lord Saturn's illusions, something that he has arranged in order to deceive me. No, there is no doubt about this at all. Even the merchant's daughter must be part of Lord Saturn's illusion. Now I will see what happens next. He then got into bed, covered his head and pretended to sleep. He pretended to sleep because he couldn't sleep. How could he sleep with Saturn's harsh gaze on him and the seven and a half years of Saturn's influence clinging to him? The king lay in bed with the covers pulled over his head, smothered with the thoughts of impending calamities. While he was in this state, the merchant's daughter, bedecked with the sixteen varieties of adornment, entered the chamber. A precious pearl and diamond necklace embellished her delicate neck, about which felt her hair which was crowded with pearls. In her nose sat a diamond stud. The divine beauty of her body shone through her rich raiment like a flash of lightning illumines the golden clouds of evening. With great hopes she entered that room, which resounded happily with the jinglings of her anklets. But when, perfumes oozing from her paws, she approached the bed, she saw that the king was asleep, his head covered with the sheet. Now, Alalaika was well versed in testing prospective suitors, and she was cunning in the art of joining herself with prospective bridegrooms. She tried to rouse the king from sleep by sprinkling him lightly with saffron water. But since the king's sleep was but a pretense, how could he be roused? A sleeping man may be made to speak, but a wakeful man will keep quiet. The merchant's daughter tried for three full hours to no avail to awaken her intended. Finally, she hung her pearl necklace over a handy peg and heaving an earnest sigh, she lay both her throbbing heart and her quivering body down at the king's side. Shortly thereafter, she was overcome with sleep. Thereupon, the king pulled the covers off his face and thought, People call me courageous and heroic and say that my mind is ever intent on assisting others. Day and night I dread sinning. Here is this young maiden <coughs> whom I will not marry. How can I explain my situation to her? If the wise regard it a sin to even speak with an unwed girl in private, how much more of a sin would it be to actually touch her? While thinking in this fashion, King Vikrama witnessed a wonder. A painted swan in one of the pictures on the wall came to life. It then dropped down from the wall to the floor, waddled over to the peg where Alalaika's necklace was dangling and started to eat it. The king marvelled greatly at this mischance and thought, this event is going to be a great source of misery for me. It's going to cost me a lot. If I take the necklace away from the swan, I will lose my reputation for never refusing someone what they ask for, since refusal causes misery. But if I let the swan eat it unobstructedly, 
a charge of thievery will be laid against me. Well, let me be charged with theft, but I will not destroy my reputation for generosity by taking the necklace away from the swan. Thinking thus, the king finally fell asleep. In the morning, the maiden arose and said to herself, This man that my father has procured for me is an impotent fool who is sleeping even now. Chapter 13 King Vikrama is falsely accused of theft and is put to work on the oil mill. Okay. Grumbling to himself thus, she stro grumbling to herself thus, she strode over to the peg to retrieve the necklace she had hung there. And when she didn't find it, she roughly woke the king and said to him, Now I see, you are in fact a mega cheat, not a limp nincompoop. You stole my necklace and then went to sleep, but you will not be able to digest my necklace. Give it back to me and hit the road. The king replied, Sister, I did not take your necklace. I was sleeping here. You are accusing me falsely. Hearing this, the outraged girl stormed off to her father and yelled at him, Father, you have really found a fit husband for me. He is a mega cheat and a thief, pervaded with a talent for robbery. During the night he stole my necklace and has hidden it somewhere. Hearing this, the merchant rushed to the king and invaded. Ooh, dunderhead! I gave you shelter in my house, fed you the choicest food, and suggested that you marry my daughter. And this is how you pay me back. What have you done? King Vikrama replied, <clears throat> I did not steal your necklace. It is the power of my ill fortune that has landed me in this soup. On hearing this, the merchant lost his temper and said to his servants, Take this rogue, tie him up and give him a good beating. Maybe then he will admit to his crime because it doesn't look as if he will admit to it without a whipping. The servant tied King Vikrama soundly with a rope and gave him a good bashing, during which the merchant kept shouting, Thrash him soundly, for only then will he admit to the theft and produce the necklace. <coughs> Compassion is inappropriate here. The merchant's servants battered the king so thoroughly that King Vikrama, acutely distressed by this tightening of Saturn's noose around his neck, cried out, Oh merchant, I don't know anything at all about this necklace. You are beating me fruitlessly. You've checked my body, inspected my clothes, but nothing has been found. Have a little compassion for me. I did not take your necklace. I don't have your necklace. I don't know anything about your necklace. You are beating me in vain. The merchant then said to his servants, This is some seasoned thief we have here, for in spite of all this pounding, he still refuses to talk. Now, take him to the king. When the king's justice has taught him a good lesson, he will produce the necklace. <clears throat> the king's merchants, the king's servants, Sorry, the, mer <laughs> the merchant servants, sorry my glasses are steaming up. The merchant servants accordingly bound both of King Vikrama's hands and led him into the presence of King Chandrasena, where they told their king the story of the necklace in full detail. Then King Chandrasena said to King Vikramaditya, Oh you scoundrel, bring out this necklace straight away and return it to the merchant. King Vikramaditya said, I didn't steal the necklace, and I do not know anything about the necklace. You have the wrong idea about this necklace, about which I know absolutely nothing. All this trouble is occurring because the planet Saturn is angry with me. I do not steal. But if you still doubt me, all right then, have it your way. I am a thief. Now, please show compassion on me. On hearing this... King Chandrasena rose like a fire blazing up and said, You imposter! You still will not admit to your crime? You stole from this merchant and are pretending not to have done so? 
<coughs> God, cut off his hands and feet and throw him out of town and see that he gets no food or water from today onwards. Saturn had turned King Chandrasena's mind topsy-turvy, making him believe that King Vikramaditya was a thief and preventing him from taking the least cognizance of King Vikrama's pleas. King Chandrasena's servants, following their master's orders, then took King Vikrama out of town to the executioner, who chopped off his hands and feet. At the moment they were hewn away, a sudden wave of woe rolled through the city. Mutilated, King Vikrama writhed in agony, screaming from the pain of his wounds, dying slowly. But the heartless servants of King, Vikra of King Chandrasena did nothing to relieve his pain. After taking King Vikrama to a desolate wood and dumping him there, they returned to their king who asked them, Oh my minions, what is the condition of that burglar? Is he dead yet or still living? The lackeys brayed, He should be, very should be dead very soon. How will he live without feet or hands? He is dying a miserable death, in extreme pain, bleeding heavily. And we have stopped everyone from giving him food or drink. He can't last long now. The paroxysms he feels in the stumps of his feet and hands are causing him to suffer like a fish out of water. The people of the city of Tamalinda had compassion for King Vikrama. But since King Chandrasena had strictly forbidden anyone to give him food or water, everyone was exceedingly afraid to provide him any assistance, lest they too end up in his pitiable state. But King Vikrama survived. If he had died, how would Saturn have been able to continue to harass him? After a month passed, the planet Saturn at last felt some compassion for King Vikrama. Saturn then created compassion in the heart of King Chandrasena, who suddenly one day asked his servants, What condition is that thief in? The flunkies replied, Great king, he's still alive, but he is in terrible shape. Without any food or drink, he's hovering on the point of death. The king ordered his men, For today onwards, have mercy on him. Give him food and drink. Following the king's orders, his servants began to provide Vikramaditya with nourishment. The townspeople began to care for him and served him with food and drink. In only a short time, <coughs> the pain from his hands and feet subsided <coughs> and strength his strength returned. But he was crippled and to move about without hands and feet caused him great difficulty and great agony. In this way, two arduous years passed for the wretched King Vikrama until one day a woman who had been born in Ujjain and who had returned there to visit her family passed by in a palanquin. She was the daughter-in-law of an oil merchant returning to her father-in-law's house in Tamalinda. As she neared the city, she spied King Vikrama under, sitting underneath a tree and saw that his hands and feet had been severed. Dumbfounded by this sight, she stopped the palanquin and rushed over to King Vikrama saying, Great King! Great King! What has brought you to this pass? How long have you been here? King Vikrama told her, O oh, chaste wife, all this comes as a result of my previous karmas. It is because my stars have turned in their courses that I have been ravaged. Lord Saturn became angry with me and put me in this miserable predicament. <coughs> there is no escape from enduring the consequences of one's karmas. Oh sister, is all well in my Ujjain? Tears came to the woman's eyes as she answered, Great King! There is great happiness in the city of Ujjain, but seeing you in this state, my heart is greatly stricken. <coughs> As you say, there is no escape from enjoying the fruits of one's previous karmas. What was to happen has happened. Now, get up and sit in my palanquin and come with me to my house. With great difficulty, King Vikrama was able to seat himself in the palanquin and the woman then transported him to the oil presser's home. Fear gripped the oil merchant as he watched the crippled ruler emerge from the palanquin, and he said to his daughter-in-law, 
daughter-in-law, why have you brought this trouble into our home? Our king had this thief's hands and feet chopped off and expelled him from our city, express strictly ordering no one to assist him. If you give him refuge in our home, our king will loot our household and will imprison us. After listening patiently, the girl replied soothingly, Oh, my father-in-law, don't fret. This is King Vikramaditya of Ujjain, who, because of his own ill fortune, <coughs> has fallen into this condition of extreme adversity. <coughs> he ruled Ujjain with great righteousness and statementship, and because of his adverse position of the planets, he has been ruined. He is a wish-fulfilling jewel fallen onto a rubbish heap, and today he is fallen into our hands. Hearing this, the oil man was astonished, and he offered King Vikramaditya every token of respect. He kept the king in his own, and pondered over how to tactfully explain this situation to King Chandrasena. The next day, the oil trader went to the court of King Chandrasena, and appealed to him allegiously. Great King, remember that thief who after having his hands and feet chopped off you had thrown out of town? Well, I feel sorry for him. So if you give the word I will keep him in my house and feed him. Chandrasena carefully considered the oilman's entreaty before giving his assent as required, as requested. Now fearless, the oil presser returned home, where Vikramaditya told him, Don't let anyone know that I am Vikramaditya, and don't speak of this matter to anyone. The oilman agreed to this, and said to King Vikrama, From now on, you should always sit atop my oil press and press out the oil, and I will keep you supplied with food and clothing. Vikramaditya, who had been the ruler of Ujjain, until he fell under Saturn's sway and was brought low, agreed to this proposal, and began to sit atop the man's oil mill all day long, pressing out the oil. See the play of destiny? Day and night the disfigured King Vikrama sat atop the oil mill, driving the oxen on as they turned the mill's axle, feeling tremendously indebted to the oil trader for the food, clothing and shelter that was provided to him. In this way, five more years passed. Now, <clears throat> those who want to know what happened next should now listen with one-pointed attention. As time went by, it became King Vikrama's want to daily sing to pass the time as he herded the oxen in their circular route around the mill. King Vikrama, who was a talented musician, knew all of the classical raggers. And one day, he sat atop the mill one day as he sat atop the mill, he began to sang, sing the Raga Dipaka in a beautiful voice. He sang his heart out until all of a sudden the potency of the melody combined with the force of his singing to cause all the lamps in the city to spontaneously ignite. It so happened that Princess Padmasena, King Chandrasena's daughter, was standing on the palace balcony at the very moment of that ignition. And she marvelled when the lamps. F she marvelled when she saw the lamps flare abruptly into life in every house in town, as if it were Dipauli, the festival of lights. She asked her servants, "Who has caused all these lights to be lit in our city today? Today is not Dipauli, and there is no grand marriage or other festival. Go and investigate. Find out who has caused these lamps to blaze." Just then. Vikramaditya completed his rendering of the Raggedy Packer, and each and every one of those lamps, just as unexpectedly, went out. Then he began the vocal elaboration of the Ragga Shri. Hearing this, the princess said, Who is this musical maestro performing anonymously among us? Are any of my servants here? Go, find out where that singer is, and hurry! Obedient to her command, the princess's maidservants scoured the city until they came to the oil dealer's house, <clears throat> where they saw him sitting on the oil press. The crippled Vikramaditya, with his defective arms and legs, singing masterfully, masterfully. Uh, seeing him, 
they scurried back to the palace and told the princess, Do you know that robber whose hands and feet were chopped off and who was thrown out of town by your father more than seven years ago? Well, that invalid is sitting in the oil miller's house pressing out the oil and singing that song. The princess then told her maidservants, Go quickly and summon him here. One brave serving girl had the temerity to object. If we bring him here now, the king will be furious with us. Let us first insert this suggestion into the king's ear so that he will not take offence when the cripple arrives here. The princess retorted, There is no use whatsoever in inserting anything in my father's ear. I will inform him later. Now, go and invite this artist to the palace, for my mind has become attached to him. The servant girls ran to the oil presser's house and, after taking the oil man's permission, invited Vikramaditya to visit the princess. He tried to decline the invitation. Suspicious that Saturn might not have finished with him yet, but when the girls insisted, he allowed them to escort him to the palace of King Chandrasena. There he met the princess, who seated him in a seat of honour and said, You are a connoisseur of raggers. Please sing one of them now and satiate my ears. Your throat is intensely sweet and your knowledge of music is total. You must in fact be some celestial musician. Thereafter, King Vikramaditya, in the crippled form created when his hands and feet were severed, spent, <coughs> spent his days in the princess's palace at her command, pleasing her mightily by singing for her in a sweet voice many different ragas and raginis each appropriate for the time of day or night that he sang them. And during the course of these concerts, the period of his seven and a half came to an end. Meanwhile, the princess had determined to wed King Vikrama only if ever she was to wed, and embarked on a hunger fast for this purpose. Her handmaidens tattled on her to the queen, who sashayed into her daughter's apartments to inquire the cause of her misery. The princess told her mother, Ma, I am determined to marry the man who has recently begun singing at my palace. I have chosen him and I shall marry no other. Immensely offended by these foolish words, her mother replied, Daughter, have you gone insane? Your destiny is to marry some eminent prince. Your station in life is as far from that of this limbless wretch as the sky is distant from the earth. Stop all this foolish prattle and be a sensible girl. But her daughter replied, I shall not break my vow. This man shall be my husband. At this, the queen began to worry that perhaps the princess's obsession would not be so easy to lift. And, that, and so she proceeded directly to consult with her husband, the king, who at that very moment was asking his courtiers, why is the princess's palace filled with beautiful raggers and raginis all day and all night long nowadays? Who is serenading her and why is the princess listening? The courtiers, all fearful of their necks should they spill the beans, all folded their hands in front of them and said politely, Great king, we know nothing about this. When you visit the palace of Princess Padmasena, Please do verify this yourself. We can say absolutely nothing about this. Please see it with your own eyes and then do what you feel appropriate. At this moment, his wife stormed into the room and told King Chandrasena all that had passed between her and her daughter. The king rose at once to his feet and marched directly to his daughter's palace where he announced to her, Daughter! What you have spoken of doing does not reflect favourably on a princess's dignity. This man is a thief and was punished with dismemberment at my command. Forget this youthful infatuation and I shall even today send my messengers to far off lands to find you an appropriate, capable, handsome prince to be your groom. The princess eyed her father coolly and replied, Father... If you speak to me any more on this matter, I shall surely relinquish my life, but I shall not take another husband. The king examined her closely and saw that her mind was made up. 
Filled with anger, he said to her, If such a fate is written in your destiny, what can I do about it? Who can change the lines of one's fate? Realising that he had no alternative, he agreed to the match, and with a heavy heart returned slowly to his palace where he lay on his bed in misery. After tossing and turning for what seemed an eternity, he fell into a deep sleep. In a dream, he saw King Vikrama whole again. Excuse me. Chapter 14. The lifting of the seven and a half and the pleasing of Lord Saturn. King Vikrama, who knew nothing of the drama that was playing out in the palace, had begun to worry. When shall I go to Ujjain and return to rule my kingdom? There's no misery left for me to undergo, and still Lord Saturn does not show me his grace. Would that he show me his grace now. As King Vikrama sat thinking thus, Lord Saturn was filled with compassion and came and stood before him. That powerful planet said, oh, Hang on, this is popped up in front of my screen, there we go. As King Vikrama sat thinking thus, Lord Saturn was filled with compassion for him and came and stood before him. That powerful planet said, O oh, King Vikrama, do you recognise me? I am Lord Saturn. Have you been singed by the blaze of my power? Tell me how much suffering you have now endured by insulting me in your court. On seeing and hearing the almighty Saturn, King Vikrama attempted to rise to his feet, but being footless, he tumbled promptly to the ground. So he rolled handlessly over to Saturn's feet in order to make his obeisance. Then said the mighty Lord Saturn, O King Vikrama, bravo for your patience. You have survived great miseries. Now request your heart's desire from me. Vikramaditya in a voice choked with emotion, replied, O oh, great ruler, you have awarded me immense distress. Give me now this boon, that you will never again trouble anyone else as you have troubled me. O oh, compassionate Lord Saturn, this is my heart's desire, that no one else should endure the miseries that I have withstood. I wish this should happen to no one else, ever. When he heard this, Saturn responded with, Bravo, King Vikrama! Well done! You could have asked for your hands and feet to be returned to you, but you feel the pain of others in your heart, and, renouncing your own selfishness, you asked for a boon for everyone else. You are verily a remover of other people's troubles, for you want to save all beings from suffering. I am very pleased with this sort of benevolent attitude. I am, in truth, so pleased that I give you this boon. May your hands and feet be again as they were before, and may you regain your previous luster. In an instant, in the instant that those words were spoken, King Vikrama's hands and feet were once again whole, and he was as handsome as he was before. Then King Vikrama placed his head on Lord Saturn's feet and said, O oh Lord Saturn, I bow to you profoundly again and again for having shown me your grace. And again, I request this boon from you that you never subject any living being of any species to this kind of torment. Chapter 15. <clears throat> Saturn stories of how he administered misery to his guru and to others. Lord Saturn then said to King Vikrama, O oh, Vikramaditya, I have not tormented you in the least. Torment is what I gave to my guru. Can you even compare your misery with his? I have also tortured the devas and asuras and filled them with woe. If you will listen carefully to their stories, you may begin to comprehend my abilities. One morning, I went to my guru with folded arms. Saluting him, I said, Guru Maharaj, I bow to you. Guruji said, yes, my child. Why have you come to me today? Tell me what I can do for you. 
I said, I am thinking of passing over your moon. My guru naturally got the shock of his lifetime and said, My son, have pity on me and don't enter the constellation where my moon sits at all. But Maharaj, I explained to him patiently, that is my duty. I cannot shirk my duty. I cannot spare anyone, not even you. If you were repulsed by the idea of giving me refuge, well then, O oh compassionate Lord, how will anyone else allow me to affect them? or obey me. Everyone will insult me. No, I am going to turn my gaze on you within a very short time. That is the way things are ordained. I may be your pupil, but for now, please ask me for grace. Hearing this, my Guru Maharaj said with alarm, How long will your gaze be on me? I told him, seven and a half years. Imp impossible, he sputtered. So I told him, at least agree to let me reside with you for five years, or at the very least two and a half years. But he was not ready to agree to this either, nor would he agree to seven and a half months, or even seven and a half days. I then had the thought that it was inappropriate for me as a disciple to serve up exceptional misery for my guru. A guru is as compassionate as a mother, which is why the guru is always worthy of worship. Realising that failure to comply with my guru's request would make me fall into hell myself, I made obeisance to my guru's feet and in a humble voice I supplicated, O oh Lord Mentor, I, the planet Saturn, am pleased with you. So, Guru Maharaj, ask, ask for a boon. My guru said to me, O oh Saturn, if you are pleased with me, then I ask this boon. Show me the compassion not to enter my body at all. I responded, If I spare you, then no one in the world will respect me. But I will give you this boon. I will stay in your moon's constellation only seven and a half praharas, which is twenty-two and a half hours. He said, Fine, O oh Saturn! You may stay in my moon sign for one and a quarter praharas. This is three hours and 45 minutes. He commanded me in this way, thinking to himself, how will my disciple be able to torment me if I pass those few hours bathing and meditating? But I came to know what he was thinking. And his arrogance so hardened my heart that it steeled my resolve. Very good, O oh great guru, I said to myself. Because you've decided to try to cheat me, you will now have to see what sort of prowess I possess and what wonders I can perform. <clears throat> when the time arrived for my brother, uh, my brother, when the time arrived for me to bother my guru, he thought to himself, I believe that I shall go down to the plain where people die is the earth, where the river Ganga flows, and take my bath there. By the time I finish bathing, my period of punishment will be over. So he headed for earth, and for the river Ganga. Taking the form of a melon merchant, I met him along his way, and when my shadow fell on him, changes began to occur in his body and his mind. I showed him two small watermelons, which I cut open slightly to show him how good they were. Seeing their sticky red juice run down, my guru became pleased with those melons. He gave me two small coins for them and put them into his bag and continued onward to the Ganga. I disappeared. After bathing in the river Ganga, my guru filled his water pot with Ganga water and, carrying these two watermelons in his bag, headed for the nearby town. Now the sons of the king and the prime minister of that city were of the same age and were devoted to each other. And the day before they'd gone out hunting together and I had caused them to lose their way. They became completely lost in the jungle and when they didn't return home by night nightfall the king began to worry and ordered his soldiers to search for them. One of the search parties came across my guru and noticed the bulging bag he was carrying under his arm. <clears throat> When the soldiers asked my guru, Great sage, what is in your bag? He replied, 
two watermelons for me to dine on later. But the soldiers remonstrated, then why is blood dripping from your bag? Oh, butcher, <coughs> are you a Brahmana or a Brahmana Rakasha? Which is a type of Rakshasa, which is a type of evil spirit. Show us what's in that bag forthwith. When my guru heard this, he asked himself, what are they talking about? And he said to them, oh, it's just watermelon juice. He looked down at the bag and he saw that it was indeed bloody and the blood was dripping from it drop by drop. For I had meanwhile changed those melons into the severed heads of the son of the king and the prime minister. Then the soldiers snatched the bag from my guru's arm and when they opened it, they found the heads of the two young, young men they were searching for. Seeing them, the soldiers were instantly filled with disgust and screamed at my guru, You villain! Now we see that you are an executioner in the guise of a brahmana and that you have no trace of compassion within you. Then those soldiers bound my guru and, flogging him at every step, marched him back to the palace where they told the king, This base, vile man has murdered your son and the prime minister's son. When the troops displayed the severed heads to the king, he swooned and fell on the floor. When he came to, he said to himself, Oh, my Lord God, you couldn't even spare my only son. This is no Brahmana. He is poison incarnate who has slain my sinless son. Go out, you men, from this city and impale this ghoul on a sharp stake. Then bring me a report. The soldiers obediently dragged my guru out to the execution ground hammering him all the way, and set a, toil, a tall pointed iron stake firmly upright in the ground, preparing to impale him. Meanwhile, in another part of the palace, the prince's wife, on hearing of his death, decided to immolate herself on his funeral pyre. Sorrow spread through the town on the heels of the news, and outside of town a crowd gathered to see the prince's murderer. They rain stones and clods of dirt on my guru, reviling him thus. This is a fiend in Brahmana's clothes. Otherwise, how could this rapscallion perform such a terrible deed? My guru was, of course, extremely depressed at this unexpected, overwhelming reversal of fortune and had not the least idea of what to do about it. So there he stood, eyes downcast, staring distractedly at the ground when one of the king's executioners came up to him and said, Great sage, prepare yourself to enjoy the fruits of your evil deeds and mount the stake. Hearing the word stake, my guru began to quake uncontrollably and he said to the executioner, Wait, wait for just a few minutes before you impale me and if I'm saved, I will give you 10,000 silver coins. What will happen to you if you wait a couple of minutes before you skewer to me? skewer me? Dread of the stake had shaken my guru out of his trance of confusion, and he'd realised that my agreed-upon time to torture him was almost up, and it was because he knew that once my gaze left him completely, he would automatically escape that he pleaded so persistently for a postponement. His entreaties eventually created a modicum of compassion within the king's servants, and they agreed to delay the execution by a few minutes. Being a renunciate, my guru had no money, but he promised it anyway, just to save himself. By the time the three and three quarter hours of my gaze had expired, and the sons of the king and the prime minister straggled into the palace where they stood before the king to salute him. Tears of joy... Lost my place. Tears of joy filled the king's eyes and he commanded a fleet messenger to hie to the execution ground, saying, Tell my men not to impale that Brahmana. Instead, bring him back to me. The messenger flew to the execution ground to deliver the message, a consequence of which my guru, as consequence of which my guru was marched back to the palace, still trussed up like a prisoner. Once there, he blessed the king and narrated to him the whole story. Thereupon, the king, in a voice choked with emotion, said, O oh Lord Guru, it was from ignorance that I laid on you the crime of my son's murder and ordered you to be impaled for this mistake 
I crave your forgiveness. My son had returned alive from his hunting trip, but not before the intoxication of my authority and wealth made me sentence you to death without thinking of what a great sin it is to slay a sage. Had you died, that evil karma would have destroyed both me and my kingdom and would have sent me to hell. Great sage, forgive such an unthinking reprobate as I. So saying, the king sat my guru on his throne and stood there before him folding his own two hands respectfully in front of his chest. Then my guru said, O king, you have committed no fault whatsoever. All this has been Lord Saturn's illusion. It is he who caused both of us this great misery. When the king called for my guru's bag and opened it again, he found two watermelons. After having my guru well bathed, his body anointed with fragrant unguents, and having his wounds attended to, the king sat him on a gilded stool and worshipped him, following which he was fed many and varied delicious morsels. My guru was given new clothes and ornaments, and his bag was filled with 10,000 silver coins, his body creaking from all the beatings he had received. My guru met the executioner as he left the palace gates and handed over all the compensation to that butcher in fulfilment of his promise. Further down the road I met him, and bowing down flat upon the ground in salute I said, Lord Guru, tell me your news. Guru said, O oh Lord Saturn, that three and three-fourths hours of your gaze have shattered my bones. Who knows what would have happened if you had spent seven and a half years oppressing my moon? You have obliged me immensely. You are the most terrible of all the planets, and those whom you seize you torment mercilessly. That which was to happen has happened. But never give anyone this sort of misery again. I have been able to withstand this torture, but no one else could have withstood it. I shall take an oath from you right now that you will not submit anyone else to this degree of anguish. I replied, O oh, great guru, anyone who is free from arrogance has nothing to fear from me, but anyone who harbours arrogance within will have to suffer as you have suffered. Lord Guru, you try to be too smart. I had to display my powers to you because of your arrogance. Now, pardon this child of yours, I shall never offend you in this way again. Having spoken in this way, I took Guru's permission to return to my own world. Hearing this story of how Saturn had harried his own Guru, King Vikramaditya was filled with wonder. Then Lord Saturn said to him, O oh, King, I have not spared any of the gods from torment. Shiva, Ramachandra, Krishna and Indra are some of the gods, and Nala, Yudhisthira and Harishandra are a few of the kings I have tortured. They now know my prowess and my power. Shiva and Lord Saturn. Once I went to Lord Shiva and said to him, O oh great God, I want to come and stay with you. Shiva replied, What is the use of you coming to stay with me? But still, if you insist, First let me know when you plan to do so, and only then enter me. I agreed. Two days later, I came to him at his home in the city of Benares, and I said, Now I am about to enter your body. On hearing this, Shiva jumped at once into the great river Ganga, which flows through Benares, and remained there in Samadhi for seven and a half years. After that period was over, he emerged and he said to me, O oh Saturn, what could you do to me? I told him, O oh great God, although your writ runs in the three worlds, from fear of me you hid yourself beneath the surface of the Ganga in Samadhi for seven and a half years. You call that doing nothing to you? Lord Shiva then saluted me and thanked me, saying, Your power is indeed profound. You are without doubt the intensest, intensest of the planets, and the average man can never survive your punishment intact. When I began to cross Lord Ramachandra's moon, 
He was forced to live, a her live as a hermit in the forest for 14 long years. O oh, King Vikrama, have you not seen my power yet? Although Ramachandra was an incarnation of God himself, my torment still made him miserable. Ravana and Saturn I displayed my talents to the likes of the ten-headed Ravana. O oh, Vikrama, after Ravana had succeeded in gaining control of all the nine planets, he installed us face down on the nine steps which led up to his throne. throne. Each morning, when he would ascend his throne, he would step firmly on the back of each one of us, causing us great anguish and insult. One day the divine Narada came to Ravana's house, and seeing me and the other planets lying face down on the steps of the throne, said to me, O oh Saturn, you are the mightiest and most terrible of the planets, but even though Ravana has insulted you to this extent, you can do nothing about it. Why is that? I replied, Because I am face down, my gaze cannot fall on Ravana, so I cannot affect him. If someone can turn me over onto my back, then I will show you what I can do. Advise him to turn me over, and I will do the rest. Narada understood and went out to search Ravana. After praising him to the skies, Narada ended by saying, But there is one thing here I do not like. Ravana indignantly asked, And what might that be? Narada replied, O oh, Ravana, you have the nine planets lying face down. Why not turn them over? so that instead of stepping on their backs each day as you mount your throne, you can step on their chests and see the discomfiture in their faces. Ravana liked this suggestion. As soon as he turned the planets over onto our backs and arranged us neatly on the steps leading up to his throne, my gaze fell on him and his mind became perverted. Within the space of a few months he kidnapped Sita and then Rama invaded Lanka and killed him and his grandsons and sons were all slaughtered, all of the result of my influence on him during his seven and a half. Others tormented by Saturn. It was in this fashion that the seven and a half came over King Harichandra. This event so perplexed his mind that he left his kingdom for Benares where he was sold into slavery. His wife was also sold, and he had to pass through seven and a half years of tribulations. His wife, Taramati, became the servant of a Brahmana and he was employed by the ruler of the cremation ground to strip the corpses of their clothes and valuables before they were consigned to the flames. All of this was my play. Likewise, King Nala had to experience a seven and a half which caused him and his queen Damayanti to leave their kingdom and encounter profound grief as they wandered in the forests. All this was due to my power for I ruined those on whom I gaze cruelly. I also beset King Indra, the lord of the gods, when my cruel gaze fell on him and he got the idea of seducing Gotama Muni's wife, Ahalia. And when Gotama Muni discovered this rape, he cursed Indra to be covered with 1,000 vaginas. When I beleaguered the moon, he stole Jupiter's wife. That black mark was laid against him, and what of Vaisist, Vashist, whose hundred sons were slain, or the Rishi Parashara, who copulated with a fisher girl, Matsyaganda, or Arjuna and his four brothers, who had to wander in the forest for many years, or the one hundred Kauravas, who were slain by the Pandavas. All these incidents were the fruits of their karmas, which I served up to them during their various seven and a half year periods, even... Sri Krishna himself had to suffer contumely during his seven and a half, O Vikramaditya, when he was accused of stealing the Sayamantaka gem. Vikramaditya said, Please tell me the story of, how, of what happened, of how it happened that Sri Krishna was, a, uh, was accused of theft. Lord Saturn began, O King Vikrama, the divine Narayana dis incarnated in Vasudeva's house as Sri Krishna to relieve the earth of her burdens. Sri Krishna had the divine architect Vashtri construct the golden city of Dwaraka for him. 
And there he lived with his 16,000 women, each in her own beautiful mansion. He even brought the Parijataka tree down from heaven to please his wives. It is said that at the time Dwaraka contained the mansions of vast numbers of the Yadava tribe, and that many of those lived there humbly but blissfully. One of the Yadavas living in Dwaraka was named Ugra, which means horrible, terrible, who had two sons, Satrajit and Prasenajit. Satrajit spent his days and nights performing penance for the sun on the seashore. Eventually, the sun became pleased with his worship and appeared before him. Seeing the resplendent sun god approaching him, Satrajit began to pause. O oh, Surya Narayana, be pleased with me and protect me with your gaze of grace. The sun said, O oh, Satrajit, I am pleased with your penance. If you have any desire, then ask for it. I shall grant any boon you name. Satrajit said, O Lord Son, I am a poor man. Uh, must be place. I am a poor man. If you are pleased with me, then give me riches. The son took the Simon Taka gem from around his neck and, giving it to Satrajit, said, Every day this gem will give you eight wagon loads of gold. You must always bathe and do your daily worship before you wear it, though, because whoever wears this gem when he is impure will be destroyed. The personified sun then disappeared. Satrajit thereupon wore the gem around his own neck and entered to Araka. As he passed through the city gates, the jewel's dazzling luster and beauty convinced the residents of Tuaraka that the sun god himself had arrived to meet Sri Krishna. Then they recognised Satrajit and realised that the brilliance radiated from the gem around his neck. Then I entered into Sri Krishna's house, both his astrological house and his material home. And as soon as his seven and a half begun, had begun, the desire to possess the Sayamantaka gem arose in his mind. Sri Krishna then called Satrajit to his court and said to him, It is very risky for you to keep this precious gem with you, because when people learn that it provides you with gold every day, they may try to steal it. Why not leave it here with me? And I will take care of it, and you can come and collect the gold from it every day as usual. Satrajit began to suspect that Sri Krishna wanted to steal the gem for himself, not keep it safely as he had promised. So he told him, My brother Prasenajit has already asked me for this jewel, and I'm sure that he can give proper care to it. So be it, said Sri Krishna. After leaving Krishna's palace, Satrajit went directly to Prasenajit and told him, Purify yourself and wear this around your neck. Prasenajit then began to wear the gem. One day, not long afterwards, Prasenajit went to the forest to hunt, and while he was an impure state, in an impure state, a lion caught him, killed him, and carried away the Siamantaka. Jambavan, the bear, attacked, attracted by the gem's glow, tracked down the lion, killed him, and carried the gem back home with him. When the rest of Prasenajit's party returned to Adaraka and couldn't tell Satrajit what had happened to his brother, the suspicious Satrajit jumped to the conclusion that Sri Krishna, greedy to possess the gem, had caused his brother to be waylaid and murdered. He voiced this suspicion to a few friends, and soon Dwaraka was abuzz with the rumour that it was he who had done Prasenajit to death and taken the Simon Taka for himself. Mothers even warned their children to steer clear of their thievish king, lest they too suffer Prasenajit's fate. When Sri Krishna returned from abroad and entered Taraka, he found all the children fleeing in terror before him, shouting, Run from Krishna, the thug who kills even children to grab their ornaments! Though this was a rude awakening, Sri Krishna divined the entire situation in an instant. Then, in order to clear his good name of this false allegation, Sri Krishna gathered a group of men together and went to the forest to search for Prasenajit. They found both him and his horse lying dead, and by following the lion's spoor they reached his body. 
giant footprints led from the dead lion to the mouth of an enormous cave, which happened to be the bear's den. After instructing his followers to wait outside for his return, Sri Krishna entered the cave. The cave was hundreds of miles deep, and Sri Krishna's own refulgence lit the way as he strode through it, marvelling all the while at the beautiful paintings inspired by the Ramayana that graced its walls. Soon he came across a great hall, outside of which Jambavan's son lay in a cradle playing with the jam. Jem, Jambavan's beautiful young daughter, Jambavati, was rocking her brother in the cradle and singing, The lion killed Prasena, and Jambavan killed the lion. Oh, brother, don't cry. The Siam and Taka jewel is yours. Sri Krishna marvelled at the sweet-voiced girl and her lullaby. And then that shining girl who had felt his presence in the dark of the cavern said to him, without even being able to see him, Leave here before my father awakes or he will kill you. Sri Krishna smiled at her warning and blew a loud blast on his conch shell. It was because of my influence that he had to experience such trouble. Hearing that note, Jambavan woke and rushed out, and between the two of them, a terrifying battle ensued. The residents of Twaraka, who had accompanied Sri Krishna, waited patiently for seven days outside the cave. Then they departed sadly for home, saying, Someone must have killed Sri Krishna in that cave, otherwise why has he not emerged yet? That epic battle in the cave continued for a full 28 days until both combatants felt that they had had their fill of it. Then Sri Krishna displayed his true form as Lord Vishnu to Jambavan. And Jambavan, realising that there was no difference between Krishna and Ramachandra and remembering his promise of aid made ages ago to Lord Ramachandra, spoke, I am very pleased with your strength, O Lord. After that lion had killed Prasenajit, it seemed appropriate to me to kill the lion and in return to take the jewel. Now I offer it, and also my daughter, to you. Please do accept them. Sri Krishna accepted the gem and took Jambavati as his wife. Then he left with them for Dwaraka, where the townspeople who had been praying for his safe return were mightily, mightily relieved and greeted him joyfully. When Sri Krishna met Satrajit, he returned the Sayamantaka to him, recounting the entire story in detail. Satrajit fell at his feet, begging his pardon for ever doubting him, and then gave his daughter Satyabhama to Sri Krishna for his wife. Satrajit also tried to entrust the jewel to him. Sri Krishna gladly accepted Satyabhama, but requested Satrajit to keep the gem. Everyone in Dwaraka was ashamed to have believed the rumour about Sri Krishna, but he forgave them. He must have then thought that this chapter in his life was now closed, but I was not finished with him yet. Satyabhama had originally been promised by Satrajit to a Yadava named Shatadamba, and this Shatadamba became embittered when she married Sri Krishna instead. When Sri Krishna went to mourn Arjuna and his brothers, who'd supposedly died at the burning of the Palace of Lak, his kinsmen, Akura and Kritavarma, hatched a plot while he was out of Turaka <clears throat> and incited Shatadanva to steal the gem. Shatadanva accordingly killed Satrajit in cold blood and took the Siamantaka for himself. When Sri Krishna came to know of this, Shatadanva deposited the jewel with Akura and fled town to try and save himself. But when they returned to Turaka, Sri Krishna and his brother Balarama hunted down Shatadamva like a beast of prey and slew him. Now it was Akrura's turn to take fright and flee, to salvage his reputation yet again, for the rumour was bruited about the city that he had plotted the burglary and the murder with his relatives. Sri Krishna called Akrura back and induced him to show the gem to everyone. Then he reassured the terrified Akrura and allowed him to keep the jewel. When he finally became free of my gaze, Sri Krishna was so immensely relieved that he joined his hands together prayerfully and said to me, O oh Lord Saturn, your mastery is miraculous. You torment everyone. 
Even the Devas and the Asuras, everyone gets misery, more or less of it, as they deserve. You are profoundly astounding. This is the way I aggravated even Sri Krishna. If I did not spare him, who will I spare? said Saturn in conclusion. Then King Vikram Vikramaditya rose to his feet and prostrated at full length to Lord Saturn, saying, O oh, Supreme Lord Saturn, glory to you. You have purified me. Now I seek this boon from you, that you will torment no living being. Lord Saturn replied, O oh, King Vikrama, it is because you are always intent on the welfare of others that you request from me the boon of removing the liability of others. I am really at a loss to find comparable, bene comparable benevolence in anyone else. The pleased Saturn then offered King Vikrama this boon. I will not torment anyone who listens to or meditates upon this Mahatmya of mine. I will protect day and night anyone who hears or concentrates on this Mahatmya and installing this book in their house worships it. If you cannot read or listen to this Mahatmya daily, do at least, at least do so on Saturdays, fasting on this day and worshipping intently. Do this particularly on the Saturdays of the lunar month of Shravana. O King Vikrama, your mind has been purified. It is now free of filth. I shall explain to you how to worship me. Pay close attention. Saturn then explained how to worship him with the hymn known as the Dasharathotka Shani Stotra. King Vikrama was immensely gratified to receive this hymn directly from Saturn's mouth. Saturn then said, your seven and a half is now completely over and your rise will now occur. Vikramaditya prostrated to Saturn and taking that planet's blessing for long life and prosperity, he said, great Lord Saturn, just as you have showered your grace on me, so shower it on every being. Let it be so, said Saturn as he became invisible, leaving Vikramaditya a wiser and much more sober man. Chapter 16 King Vikrama reveals his identity. Amazement overwhelmed the princess the next morning when she saw on King Vikrama the limbs he had lost seven and a half years before. Seeing her stunned, Vikrama disclosed to her his identity and told her the whole story hearing which she became exceedingly delighted. She then told the whole story to her companions, who hurried to tell the king and queen. King Chandrasena, meanwhile, had arisen from his bed after the vivid dream which had awakened him. And, rushing to his daughter's palace, he saw King Vikrama, as gorgeous as the god of love himself, sitting there. When King Ch Chandrasena asked, Who are you? King Vikramaditya replied, I am that thief that stole the merchant's necklace. Chandrasena said, So I see, but your hands and feet were chopped off at my order, and I see that now you have both your feet and your hands back again. Please explain this mystery to me so that my confusion may be dispelled, dispelled and my doubt disappear. I am called the heroic Vikramaditya, began King Vikrama and I am the king of the city of Ujjain. He thereupon related the entire story of his seven and a half to King Chandrasena, who fell at his feet begging forgiveness for himself for having so cruelly mistreated such a great king. But Vikramaditya told him, the only offence that has been committed here is the offence committed to my destiny. The planet Saturn's impatience possessed my body for a full seven and a half years and it was because I had insulted Saturn that I was in such a sorry plight. What did you have to do with any of that? You only acted to fulfil the destiny that Saturn had mapped out for me. Then King Chandrasena offered his daughter's hand in marriage to Vikramaditya and sent for the merchant who had accused that hero of stealing the necklace. Hearing the summons, the merchant came to the court post-haste 
and asked King Chandrasena, What is your command, your majesty? King Chandrasena asked, Have you recovered your necklace? The merchant replied, Yes, great king. A painted swan had swallowed it, and later, when the swan brought it back up, I was wonderstruck. King Chandrasena said, O merchant, this was all an illusion created by Lord Saturn. Taken in by this illusion, you accused of stealing it, the stranger who was your guest. Your guest has now arrived here. Do you recognise him? He is Ujjain's valorous King Vikramaditya, who has been brought to that pass due to Saturn's ire. The merchant's eyes became round like saucers when he saw King Vikrama in his palace whole again. Falling prostrate and clasping Vikramaditya's feet piteously, he babbled requests for mercy for having laid a false charge of theft and requested any punishment in return. But King Vikrama said to him, O merchant, this was not your fault. Lord Saturn, who was angry with me, caused all these events to occur. On hearing this, the merchant offered King Vikrama his own daughter's hand in marriage with an immense mound of gold coins as dowry. Now the king sent his messenger to call the oil merchant, who came hastily to his court, folding his hands respectfully, and asked, O king, what is your command? King Chandrasena said to him, Do you recognise who's sitting here? Now Vikramaditya's body shone dazzlingly like the sun, and his lustre was so incomparable that the oil trader could not properly recognise him. Then the king said, This is the man who drove the oxen at the oil press in your home. Now do you recognise him? The oilman said, he resembles him strongly in the face, but how can I be sure? King Chandrasena now told the oil press the whole truth and said, This is the heroic King Vikramaditya. In consideration for your attentive hospitality to him, I award one village to you and your descendants. Hearing this, the oil man was mightily pleased. Chapter 17 King Vikrama returns to Ujjain. Then Vikramaditya himself gifted a village to the pleased oil trader's daughter-in-law, and he celebrated his marriage to the princess and to the merchant's daughter with appropriate pomp and grandeur. There followed a full month of feasting and enjoyment, after which he and his wives departed for Ujjain, accompanied by numbers of servants, horses, elephants and chariots. All these accompanied him into his city with music and rejoicing, and the entire procession was escorted through the streets by all the people of Ujjain, who streamed out of the capital in order to welcome their king on his arrival. The next day, everyone in Ujjain celebrated the whole day through. While King Vikrama's heralds made this announcement in the king's name in all parts of the city, Lord Saturn is the greatest of the planets, let no one suffer as I did for belittling him. Then, on an auspicious day, King Vikrama ordered the erection of a temple to Lord Saturn, and the populace began to diligently perform Saturn worship. Anyone who reads or hears this story with full concentration and heartfelt devotion will obtain relief from all misery.